Welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center, and we're very pleased you're all here today, and we're particularly pleased to have Professor Martin Carnoy with us. Uh, Martin Carnoy hardly needs an introduction, uh, but I think he is someone who over the years has provided a particularly original and compelling vision to a range of issues related to education. He is a labor economist who has done pioneering work on the relation of education, learning, and the structure of the workplace. He has done a lot of work on educational reform and broad, uh, more broadly speaking, domestic educational issues. And of course, what he is going to talk about today, which is education as a global force in a variety of different settings. In particular, he is talking about the triumph of the BRICS, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China. He is involved in a new project on India, China, and Russia, and higher education. I suspect some of that will run through this. Uh, he will speak, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So, Martin, we're very pleased that you're here. And he is a professor, how could I forget this? Uh, the Vita Jacks Professor of Education at, uh, remind me, uh, Stanford <laughs> The University. other one, the other one. <laughs> As I was coming from the gym yesterday, I noticed, um, this was around 6 o'clock in the afternoon, I noticed that uh, Stanford had beaten Berkeley in the adjoining uh, basketball stadium. I, I don't want to dwell on that. Uh, anyway, I actually saw the end of the game on television as I was doing my exercise. Oh, God. I forgot to turn this thing off, which I will do now. All right. So, actually, the project is not just about Russia, India, and China. It also includes Brazil. And so, we are. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm not going to do a super duper uh, complicated analysis. I just uh, want to brief you on what is happening uh, in these four countries as far as uh, university expansion is concerned and the pattern of that expansion, uh, because it is a recent phenomenon in I mean, recent, the last uh, 15, 16 years, I mean, that, that recent, in terms of uh, uh, these four very large countries. Uh, these four countries' population represents 40% of the entire world population. So uh, these are uh, important countries, in, certainly in terms of the number of people involved, and their economies are very large too. In fact, they're predicted, these four economies, to pass the, uh, all economies in terms of size except the U.S. And, I mean, each, uh, each of them, uh, in terms of uh, uh, compared with other economies, except for the U.S. and Japan by the year 2050, according to Glo Goldman Sachs. In fact, Goldman Sachs, uh, a guy named O'Neill, invented this phrase called BRICS. Now, the South Africans are trying to latch on, so it would be BRICS up. <laughs> anyway, that hasn't quite happened yet. But uh, that's the, uh, uh, the most important economy uh, on the African continent. Not the largest population, but the most important economy. Okay, so what is the story here? That, uh, that after four or five years of uh, researching this, what can we pull out of what is happening? <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, um, the most important thing that seems to be happening is that these countries can't quite afford to do this expansion uh, uh, the way Europe did it and the way the United States did it, which is uh, largely through free public university. I know that seems like a distant memory here, but uh, it isn't actually that distant because uh, even um, after uh, University of California started charging tuition uh, back in the early 70s, the tuition was very low uh, that was being charged. And so for all intents and purposes, uh, in well into the 80s, 
the, the education at the University of California, and certainly at the state universities and the community college, was practically free. So this is not true in these countries, as I'll show you. And secondly, what didn't happen in Europe and the United States is happening here, which is they are really divided themselves into elite universities and mass universities. But we do that here, but, uh, and uh, uh, not so much in Europe, but we do it here. Uh, and what's important about this is that here, the differentiation did not increase over time. In other, from, from a financial standpoint or from uh, any real standpoint. I mean, if you compare, California is a good example because you have three levels of differentiation. You have the University of California system, you have the state university system, and you have the community colleges. I mean, it was planned that way. Uh, so it was differentiated. And Burton Clark said that differentiation is, in fact, the strength of the university. It says everybody's got some access to it or should have some access to it. And it's at different levels for different people. But <clears throat> the fact is, at the spending per student, uh, for years has not changed between those ratio. I mean, uh, you see uh, system, uh, the spending per students a lot more. Before it started to go down, it was about $21,000 per student. Uh, this is spending, not the tuition. The spending per student, about 20, in the low 20s. Uh, the state universities are about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 per student. This is everything included. Uh, uh, not, not, res not research money, but all, everything else, service, student services, et cetera. And uh, the, the community college system is lower. It's about eight or $9,000, about the same price as uh, K-12 to public education. So <clears throat> that differentiation exists, but it didn't increase. In these countries, as I'll show you, it is increasing. And those the elite universities are getting increasingly more money, and the mass universities, in many cases, are getting less money. So maybe that's going to happen in the U.S. too. It may be happening right now. It hasn't been examined properly. But the second thing is that uh, these systems have become uh, uh, very rationalized in the sense that um, people have to take entrance tests to get in. And, in. and in a couple of cases, and maybe even now in Brazil, in the third case they're trying to do, it'll be a national entrance test to get into university. And in addition, they're becoming increasingly vocationalized, which means you, fewer and fewer students, a smaller percentage of students is going into what could be called more general um, kind of subjects and more into engineering, business, medicine, uh, very, very uh, voc vocationalized subject aimed mainly to train people for very specific occupations. The third factor, uh, and that speaks back to uh, the fact that they can't quite afford it, is cost sharing. So all of these countries have figured out one way or another to cost share the price uh, of uh, the cost of going to university, uh, either through tuition fees in public universities, and some of these get very complicated, as I will explain to you. And <clears throat> the second thing is for an increasing percentage of private universities in some countries. In a country like Brazil, it's almost 80% of entering students now go into private institutions. Um, the fourth thing is that it's, as I mentioned, uh, there's a big uh, sci and tech, science and tech disciplinary expansion uh, in all these countries. Uh, uh, even in countries like uh, Brazil and India, um, uh, which started at a very low level in terms of uh, percentage of engineers, uh, this is increasing. Uh, and um, the other point that is uh, rarely talked about is why, in fact, this expansion has occurred so quickly. And a very good explanation comes from the fact that the payoff has either started out very high, like in Brazil, or has gone up like in, uh, at a very rapid rate, as in China. Uh, and both India and uh, Russia have also gone up not quite as fast. So those are the attributes that I want to talk to you a little bit about. Okay, so first of all, in terms of enrollment expansion, I mean, this is pretty dense, but I took it back to 1920 to show you a couple of things. First of all, that European expansion 
First of all, the U.S. Uh, look is way. This is the students enroll per hundred thousand population. So this is a relative measure, not an absolute measure. So look, look at this. The U.S. in 1950 was already at 1,500 students per 100,000 population. Look where uh, uh, United Kingdom was, 242, or Germany uh, at 350 in 1950. I mean, really elite system still. Uh, you can't even find that number back in, 19, in 1920. The U.S. already had more than those European countries had in the 1950s, okay? And it really isn't until the, the, big, the, the big jump occurs in Europe uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. Look at the explosion uh, starting in 1965, I mean really in 1960. But the big explosion occurs after 1965, even really after 1968. Uh, 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 so. Uh, and the United Kingdom still lags behind, but then begins to catch up in the 1970s and 80s with the uh, red brick universities. Uh, anyway, all that expansion, and even in the U.S., the big expansion, which was earlier on, up to 1970, uh, was free for all intents and purposes. Okay? I'm not arguing that it should have been, but it just was free. Okay, it was public, basically the public system expanding. And the same, uh, less so in Japan, which started quite early with private universities. And now look at where our uh, countries of interest are. They, their big expansion doesn't start until really uh, uh, starting at about 19, in fact, starting in 1995. Okay, now, of course, uh, Brazil was already, uh, had already expanded in a previous period, which was in the 1970s, um, but then it slowed down and uh, then started really exploding in 1995. I only took it to 2005. It's gone up uh, very rapidly since then, too. <clears throat> the USSR, which is, uh, and then Russia, is an anomaly in a sense that they, like the U.S., expanded quite early. Uh, because the communists believed in education. They believed in a labor theory of value uh, and therefore invested heavily in uh, human capital. Uh, they, by 1970, were, uh, even though not as much as the U.S., were ahead of Japan in terms of the number of students enrolled. But uh, it, had, it had slowed down. Look, by 1995, it was actually lower than in 1970. And then this huge explosion occurs after 1995 in, in, in Russia. And India if, uh, lags far behind, but it too, starting in 1995, uh, begins to expand rapidly. And China, uh, this thing in China, if I taken it to 2010, it would have at least uh, doubled to 1173. So this is, so you can see three waves. You can see the uh, USSR, uh, United States, uh, Japan um, uh, starts a little earlier too, not quite as early as the US and USSR. Uh, and then Europe uh, wave <clears throat> is only really uh, uh, 40 years old. Uh, and then comes uh, not uh, 30 years after Europe, comes this next group. So it isn't like they're way delayed. 30 years is not a long time in development. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the way the expansion has gone. Um, now, comparing the four countries, uh, this is a complicated uh, graph or chart, but uh, let me just give you some um, uh, interesting uh, facts about this. Uh, in Brazil, um, the elites are uh, basically concentrated in the federal universities, the elite universities that are federal universities, not all of them, 
but a high fraction of students in elite universities go to federal universities, uh, plus um, a couple of um, state universities, and notably um, University of Sao Paulo and Campinas in the state of Sao Paulo, plus uh, some notably elite uh, private universities, uh, particularly the Cat. There are three, three Catholic universities that you could say are elite universities. Uh, and there are one or two others, like uh, Candido Mendes uh, in Rio. But uh, that's, uh, the rest are mass universities, particularly the privates in Brazil. The private university, big expansion, is in rather low cost, um, uh, a third of them, uh, including the Catholic University, if you include all the private universities, a third of them are for-profit universities, openly for-profit universities. So they're in it for the buck. But even the non-profits, uh, except for maybe the confessional universities, <clears throat> are basically running surpluses, even though they declare themselves as non-profit. Um, and they're mass universities for the most part. They're absorbing the huge fraction of new students. Okay? Now, in general, and when we get down to uh, equity, in general, you'd think that because it's very hard to get in the federal, federal universities are free. So are the state universities, totally free of charge, but very hard to get into because of the examination system. So guess who gets into them? Largely people from the upper middle classes. And uh, the upper, upper, upper classes go abroad, but the upper middle classes. So roughly, I would say today, about 50% of all students in the Brazilian uh, state, uh, either state or federal universities, in the public universities, come from the top 20% of income earning families. Now, you think that the private universities somehow are attracting people lower down because they can't get in. And a lot of people believe that. I believe that also. It turns out to be wrong. It turns out that the people going to the private universities are on average even richer than the people going to the public universities. So roughly, about over 55% of the people going to the private universities are, so these are sort of the stupid rich kids that can't get into the publics for free. By the way, also went to private secondary schools. About 55% of the people going to the public universities went to private secondary schools. So they invest in pretty expensive private secondary schools so that they can get free public education at taxpayer expense. Now, it's the same debate as happened in California in uh, 1969 over the University of California. Because who went to the University of California in 1969? The difference in average family income between the kids that went to Berkeley and the kids that went to Stanford was about $1,000 per year at that time. Now, 1969, that meant $20,000 versus $21,000, something like that. That was a lot of money in those days. You have to multiply by about five. So uh, it's the same debate today. Uh, in, in California, it was decided after a big debate among economists that it was inequitable to give uh, taxpayer-funded education completely free to people that, who could afford to pay and were getting in because they ex had better earlier education and all the support of their families so that they could score high on the entrance tests and get good grades and do AP courses, et cetera. It's the same debate that's going on today. But in any case, at that time, it was free versus uh, paying something. Same debate in Brazil, although if, it's, if you want to really get rocks thrown at you in a public space, uh, discuss this issue, as I have, uh, and had, of all people, the left attack me uh, because they consider this commodification of the university. But in any case, um, the public university does do better than the privates in terms of uh, a couple of things. They do have affirmative action in Brazil, as they do in India, not in the other two. Uh, although you could argue in Russia, as the Russians have argued with me, that their 
they had the earlier affirmative action policy, which started to get people into the university uh, with points coming from working class and peasant families. Now they don't do that anymore. Okay, so how does this differ in Brazil from uh, the other countries? Well, in Russia, they changed the constitution, uh, or they, they, they reinterpreted the constitution in the early 90s after the fall of uh, communism so that they could charge tuition in public universities. So there are free places for those people who can score high on the exam, depending on the field. You've got to choose a field. Some fields are harder to get into than others, such as economics and business. That's the most popular field. So they have free places which are allocated by the government to universities. By the way, today, 76% of the age group in Russia attends university. I'm not talking about post-secondary. I'm talking about universities. This is a, the, the figure in the United States is, I think, about 45% in the low 40s. Uh, attends university. I'm not talking about community colleges, I'm talking about universities, four-year universities. So these are, so in Russia it's 76 percent as far as, as close as we can get. Now, half of those pay fees to public universities. So public universities were allowed to sort of take more students, but at full tuition. Right? And full tuition is not cheap, it's about $3,500, $4,000 a year. Okay. In India, the universities are essentially free, public universities, but the biggest growth has been in private education and in fields which are popular, such as business, medicine, and engineering. Today, more than 95% of engineering students attend private institutions, 95%. And the fees vary. India has a strong affirmative action policy, so, uh, which covers 50% of Indians. 50% of Indians fall under affirmative action. Uh, and the unit on private and public universities must admit, must meet that quota. Now, uh, those people pay lower fees, and people who can score high on the tests, entrance tests, pay lower fees, even in private universities. However, there's a 25% group, the last 25%, who don't fall under affirmative action, who don't get high scores on the exam, and they negotiate with each university and how much they will pay. Of course, the lower your score, the more you pay. Okay, so some of the charges are just astronomical, and it varies enormously from uh, college to college. Now, um, China is just straight fees. Everybody pays fees. The fees are higher in private institutions. Now they're about 20% uh, of students going to private institutions, maybe a little less at the university level. Uh, uh, but their fees have not gone up since 2005. It's sort of a political, uh, it's politically, uh, they, but they, I don't know when they're going to raise them in the future. But as a result, they're, since their nominal fees have not gone up, the, the real cost to people has gone down quite a bit. Okay, I think that covers. Uh, so very quickly, I want to run you through these things because I want to leave time for questions. Um, so here's the enrollments. These numbers are staggering, of course, in China and India. These are the enrollments in the, B, in the BA level, the bachelor's level. Um, in Russia, by the way, the bachelor's level is shifting over from being a five-year degree to a four-year degree. Uh, <clears throat> but um, you can see that, I'm sorry, the top got knocked off, in fact, on mine too. But the first one, is um, uh, Brazil, elite and non-elite. So the purple lines are 2009. So you can see in Brazil, there are about uh, four and a half million students going to non-elites and about a half a million going to elite university, about 600,000. It's about the ratio. 
uh, they're all going up. Uh, and the next one is uh, Russia, uh, in which there are about uh, more than in, even though uh, the population of Russia is about 135 million, so, and probably in terms of the young people, they have many fewer uh, uh, young people than uh, uh, Brazil. Uh, even so, they enroll more people. And in the non-elites, uh, it's uh, also very high. And then we get to um, India, for uh, whom we only have uh, two years. There's, uh, I think we just have one year, right, for India. And that's, uh, you can see the huge, very, uh, relatively very small number in elite universities, but in absolute terms, it's huge. It's 1.2 million uh, st uh, students. And then China, uh, uh, again, uh, the, the absolute numbers are huge, even though the relative numbers are, uh, are about the same as in other places. And engineering graduates, which, by the way, is the focus of our, a lot of our study, uh, because the, I mean, the, the underlying question is, are these countries going to overwhelm uh, the sort of information economy and the high-tech production? And so here you have some idea of what's going on. Um, uh, the U.S. Uh, in um, uh, recent years has been pretty steady, produce about 70,000 engineering graduates a year, okay, four year only. Uh, uh, China in elite universities uh, produces uh, twice that number, just in elite universities. And uh, India, on the other hand, uh, produces relatively few in elite universities. Now, we've all heard, I'm sure you have them here in graduate school, uh, from the Indian Institutes of Technology, uh, the famous uh, really great Indian engineers. And they are really great. Now, the question is whether the Indian Institutes of Technology are so great but the fact is that the students are so highly selected that they're incredibly smart to start with. Uh, on the other hand, I'll say something about the students in a second, they produce very few of these people. Even though they doubled the number of the Indian Institutes of Technology just now, in the last uh, three years, uh, they still uh, will produce only 40,000 uh, of all the, not just IITs, but there's a, also another the NITs, all of those only 40,000 engineers in a country which has, I don't know, 1.3 billion people. So uh, it's a r relatively small group. Um, and then uh, uh, Russia actually produces more engineers than uh, India, uh, and uh, Brazil is down the list. Um, so I know uh, you're uh, interested in, uh, in um, Brazil, so you can see what's happened in private education, which is the dark blue line, um, and uh, public education, which is the green line, and uh, the federals are the uh, maroon line. So this is the percentage of students, and you can see that the privates have been increasing steadily, and this is only till 2006. The number keeps, the percentage keeps going up, and the yellow, I guess it's yellow on here instead of green. Uh, yellow and, and, and uh, maroon uh, keeps going down as a percentage. And here's Russia. I just wanted to show you that about half the students, which is the um, uh, yellow line, public paying. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the public budgetary, which is uh, this one, has been almost flat uh, since uh, 2000. So the number of places that has remained flat to, to, you know, somewhere around 3 million. And this is the pay. So they've caught up. In fact, they've passed them now. Uh, this is too much. And then India, just to tell you, is that the, the, the fast-growing ones, uh, growing rapidly, are the unaided uh, public colleges growing rapidly. And the rest are, uh, and the uh, deemed are very small. This is uh, private universities. So colleges, in order to become a university and get independent, by the way, in India, the private colleges are highly regulated. 
they must belong to a university or college in the English system. Uh, it took me years to figure out what the hell they were talking about. But uh, they, uh, people go to colleges which are basically affiliated with the university. And a university can be public and the colleges are private, which is actually uh, the, the dominant mode in uh, engineering. Uh, and so they are completely controlled in terms of exams, curriculum, et cetera, by that uh, a public university. So it's, uh, uh, they would like, they'd like to get out from under it, so they have to form a graduate school and they have to uh, uh, appeal to the state in which they are in order to get, become a deemed university, which means that they've been deemed by the state to allow it to be independent of a, of a uh, public university. Okay, um, our argument is that this uh, expansion occurred uh, for two reasons. Number one, the secondary schooling had expanded greatly. And so there are a lot of people putting pre uh, pressure to get into university. And secondly, the economic payoffs to higher education uh, went up. Uh, and in Brazil, uh, they have remained high, although they've dropped slightly in recent years with this tremendous expansion of graduates. So the governments, as a reason of these two pressures, basically is responding because they have to seek legitimacy domestically. But in addition to that, they, there's a kind of a, uh, I would say I would attribute this sort of the John Meyer, uh, Francisco Ramirez, that sort of uh, converging world uh, culture uh, argument that uh, the idea is if you don't have really good universities, you're not a modern, progressive, developed country or a developed country to be. So you got to develop these world-class universities. So there's a, a real frenzy going on to develop world-class universities, particularly in the former communist countries, China and Russia. I, well, China's still communist, but anyway, they're sort of half communist. I don't know what you call them. But, uh, the point is that um, uh, they believe that in order to get standing world, here are world powers, they consider themselves world powers, they must have these world-class universities. Now, it's no accident that some Chinese university uh, in uh, Shanghai came up with this uh, list based on a few criteria, Nobel Prize winners, number of uh, articles, by the way, in science and technology journals, not in economic journals, uh, and it's a very short list of criteria, and then they ranked all these universities, and then the Times of London, uh, the Times Supplement, uh, Literary Supplement, uh, decided that they had to get in on the act, and so now they have their list, and it differs pretty substantially. I mean, they differ quite a lot. So it's like Newsweek, et cetera. Everybody loves these horse races, and so believe it or not, they worry about this. I mean, China's obsessed with it, and Russia's becoming obsessed with it. Uh, how to, and so they're pumping an enormous amount of money into these institutions. So here's, I just want to show you one case. This is a Chinese case. And look, these are, we don't have what they call the elite universities. We could have done, I mean, the world-class universities. We could have done that. But just to show you, there are 111 ministry higher education institutions, and then they're the rest maybe several thousand down here, okay, in the red line. And look what's happening to the cost per student. This is in real terms, 2008, uh, adjusted for inflation. So, first of all, when they began the expansion, they differentiated them, put more money into the hundred, and look, it's even going up. I've had uh, Chinese scholars tell me, oh, no, no, now they're paying more attention to the bottom. Yeah, look how much attention they're paying to it. They're letting it go down even further. Now, the one thing they've done, however, it, so you can understand the argument, the tuition now represents, it used to represent um, uh, back here, um, it used to represent about half the revenue of these uh, redliners, uh, and now they only represent about a third of the revenue. So the government is putting more money into them, 
outside of uh, tuition payments, but it's still uh, their cost per student are going down. And in Brazil, it's harder to figure out what's going on because uh, the non-elites are largely private, and we don't really know uh, accurately how much, the, how much tuition they charge. Uh, it's possible to find out for a single year, the current year, but over time it's hard. We're going to try to do it. So people have tried to do it, but they've uh, done a very bad job of doing it, very unrepresentative samples, et cetera. But in any case, this is the result of that study. Uh, I don't believe it, but there's some reason to believe that the tu real tuition has gone down over time. And so you can see that the spending per student is also being more and more differentiated. The last thing I want to talk to you about and take questions is how the money is being distributed uh, among uh, income groups from the public subsidy. And I have to, uh, we were able to measure this for two countries, Brazil and Russia. And this is very interesting because I told you before that uh, the system is pretty inequitable. Uh, 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 it's not, it may not be as equitable as it, inequitable as it seems. I'll tell you the other argument. But look, the bottom 40% of uh, um, income, uh, students from the bottom 40% of income uh, families um, in Brazil uh, have jumped from uh, getting 7% to about 12% of the total amount spent on Brazilian uh, universities by the public sector. Uh, um, all universities. It's not all on public universities, but this is the total. And then look what happens at the top 10%. They've gone down from 35% to 30, and if you want to count the top 20%, they've uh, gone down from about 57% uh, uh, down to 50% uh, of the spending. So it's headed in the right direction, largely through affirmative action, by the way, um, in public universities. And now, uh, the Lula government, before he left office, uh, came up with a thing called uh, uh, Uni something. Uni Pro, no, Uni. Pro Uni. Pro -uni. Thank you. Pro Uni. So Pro Uni is a subsidy that's given to uh, either a tax credit or a direct subsidy that's given to a private university for accepting uh, certain categories of students. You're generally black, haven't gone to uh, uh, have gone to public secondary schools, and in some cases there's an income thing, but it's mostly those two things. Uh, it's um, race and uh, where they went to the secondary school. And by the way, the affirmative action policies of public universities, which are voluntary, have uh, also followed the same kind of criteria. It varies from university to university. Now, what's interesting is that there has been an attempt in the Brazilian Congress starting in 2005 to try to get an affirmative action law passed, and it has yet to pass. It, it finally passed the lower house, uh, the, um, I guess what we could call a, uh, the uh, House of Representatives, their House of Representatives, but it's, not, it's stuck in the Senate now. And it's very controversial and very difficult to get passed. Now look what happens in Russia. In Russia, they have the same issue at the top end. They get most of the money. This is where 76% of people are going to university. Okay? Still the top end is getting most of the money. But the difference is at the bottom end, where the bottom quintile, and if you take the two quintiles, that's 40%, uh, rather than getting 12%, they get uh, 14 uh, plus about 13, they get about 27%. To the bottom 40% get 27% rather than 12%. And it's the middle that's sort of left to pay most of the money. Now, the only counter-argument to this, I'm not going to go through this. Oh, there is a very interesting thing. I love this thing. This is what happens in Brazil. The one way you can measure the quality is value added. Okay, so we, we are able to get data on Brazil on value added. Okay, because they have a thing, the Anadja test, uh, which is given to first and fourth, first and last year students in every field. So I'll just show you computer science. So what's interesting here is what happens to the students there who are in the bottom half of the first year in Naja test. This is it. Look, they, their, their initial 
test score, the first year students in 2008, these are two different cohorts, but it, it doesn't matter, same test. The first year cohort, you can see it's the bottom half, so they score an average of 20 on the test, and the fourth year students in, who came in with bottom half scores uh, uh, three years before uh, get a score about 27. Now, here's the top half of the distribution who came in with the highest 50% of scores into computer science programs, and they started out uh, not at 20, but at about uh, 25, and they end up at 32. So the value add is about the same, but here's what's kind of interesting. These are the first year scores of the um, 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 more selective students, that's that upper line, and the last year scores of the less selective, selected, the lower half students, they end up at the end of the, uh, at the same place that the more selective students started. So you go to college for, or you go to university for four years, and you end up where the other guy started. So imagine you're in computer science, and basically, you're scoring the same on the computer science test, this is a specific test, as the people who got into university scored in the first year and who are in the upper half of the distribution. So the lower half of the distribution is basically at the same place that the upper half was in their first year, basically having almost no courses in computer science. So that's scary. That means you're turning out, uh, probably uh, because these have a higher dropout rate, so that makes it even worse. Actually, these are the more selected. This bottom line is the more selected of the bottom half because they're more and more likely to drop out. And these are the ones who finish. Okay. And again, this is the fourth year scores of the two. And it's about two standard deviations higher. Standard deviation half. Okay. It turns out, by the way, that one of the biggest explainers, even controlling for a lot of other stuff, of the, of the difference in value added is due to uh, the percentage of PhDs in the program, teaching in the program. Yay for PhDs. Anyway, <laughs> so that's it. So this is all, I gave you just some, we, it, Brazil's the only country in the world where you can do this, uh, this kind of value-added stuff. And it's very, very interesting, because it, it does show that even with 32% of the age cohort, that's in Brazil, uh, uh, you are getting this kind of differentiation between uh, uh, students who come in the bottom half versus students that come in the top half. And so there, one of the arguments that you see, when you start out in the bottom half of the distribution <clears throat> and you realize that you're going to be even more selective, the people who finish, you know, who start out in the bottom half are going to be sort of the more dogged, uh, they, they start out with every, you know, one tie, hand tied behind their back and they still finish university. Uh, they should be, have much higher gains than the people who started in the top half. It's much harder to get someone who's in the top half to make big gains, okay? But they don't. So what that tells you is that the institutions they're going to are probably terrible. They're, the best they can do is bring this more selective group from the bottom half up to where the other guys started. So it's a real damnation of these private institutions. And there are people going around Brazil saying, oh, the private institutions have a higher value added, et cetera. It's not true. It is not true. I mean, even our regression analysis shows that there is controlling for these other things that private institutions are doing far worse, significantly worse, in value added. So. You have questions? I mean, it would be interesting to take some of these different systems and compare on the same kind of score as test, even U.S. students in, in various disciplines. Well, the <laughs> OECD is about to do this. There's a thing called the Ahello Project. Which, have you ever heard of the PISA, the program of the International Student Assessment? 
program spelled with a double M-E, by the way, uh, because it's, I don't know why everybody favors this spelling. But anyway, um, they do a thing, uh, this is the, you know, when, when uh, politicians say, oh, the U.S. is 21st in math in the world, they're referring to this PISA test. Okay, um, so now the same people who brought you the PISA test are now going to test students in the last year of university. Now you won't be able to do a value added, just like you can't do in a PISA. So you can't evaluate the institution. I've, I've talked to the Hello people and said, you should at least collect the entrance test scores on all the students that you survey. That way you could get a value added. You could see where they started. Okay, uh, but they're going to do it. They're doing it in engineering and economics to start with as a pilot. So you'll soon have, uh, I think it's, tw uh, by 2014, you'll see results of that. Thank you, that's really interesting presentation, Mark. Um, along the same lines of this question, I was thinking of the book that just came out in the United States academically addressed. Oh, yeah. Basically suggesting that, you know, there's no value added. There's no value added to yeah. university or college in the United States. Um, so given given your sense of the quality of some of these private institutions that are serving what looks like the non-elite, right, those who can least afford, essentially, to, to go to university. They're, they're fairly elite, but they're not very high-scoring right. kids, yeah. So how, I'm wondering just about the financing of this. So is there a big loan industry that's also popping up so that students can pay their tuition? Not really, not, not really. That's why relatively few low-income kids, and that is why the pro-uni uh, happened, because, well, the pro-uni, in reality, is a subsidy to these institutions. Uh, of course, they have an incentive to keep those people in because they keep getting the money for them, but you could argue that they don't have an incentive because they can always get somebody to replace them. Uh, <clears throat> but in any case, it's like a voucher program, uh, which is designed to save uh, Catholic schools in, uh, you know, old urban centers. Uh, so it's the same kind of thing. I think, I mean, I'm for pro-uni, anything that subsidizes uh, low-income kids to get in to university. But I'm not so sanguine about bringing them into institutions which are really bad. And I have a feeling uh, that many of these institutions that are taking these people are uh, not, not very good. So it's sort of a public yeah. or very low. Right. Point. So what, how does this play out in the long term? Do you think there'll be increased regulation or there'll be well, better accreditation of these universities? Well, they have accreditation, but the thing is, you've got to remember, when you have a, um, a block of institutions that is that big, they have tremendous influence over the Brazilian Congress and they have in the past. I'm not, I'm not talking about some hypothetical. They have in the past. They have, as, as a result of their influence over the Congress, they've been able to get, for example, many institutions accredited as universities, but they're not universities. Okay, and there's been a huge consolidation effort going on. Oh, it's, it's just about over. The eight of the 11 largest universities in, um, in Brazil are private in terms of number of students. And only one of them is a Catholic university, and that's the Belo Horizonte, which has a lot of branch campuses. But the others are all these diploma mills, uh, and they just enroll a hell of a lot of students. They're sort of, uh, uh, Phoenix University is, got one of them, I think. Um, but they're, like, they're Phoenix-like universities. A lot of distance learning, uh, night classes. Uh, they're run very top down, and there's been a study of how they're run very top down. Uh, uh, professors are hired to do certain jobs. Uh, now, the Congress has passed a law that they have to have multiple full time professors and a higher fraction of PhDs. But right now, I think the fraction of PhDs in all private universities is 15%, while it's closer to 50% in the publics teaching. Now, on the plus side, Brazil has a terrific expansion of graduate education, uh, and they produce, in terms of number of scientific articles, uh, per 
uh, student uh, produce uh, more than China. They're, of those four countries, they produce the most. Uh, they and they and Russia in scientific articles. But uh, their big problem in Brazil and particularly in India is the low quality of their K through 12 education. So. The, I, the, if you want to produce more engineers and your math scores are very low coming out of secondary school, it's very hard. I mean, not all, not all Brazilians have low math scores, but very few are scoring at the higher end compared to China. Now, I'm not talking about Shanghai because uh, uh, PISA did uh, Shanghai students. I, I guess you don't hear about these. I'm, I'm used to talking to audiences that are really like right on top of PISA scores and things. But uh, everybody's running around saying, oh my god, the Chinese are going to kill us because Shanghai scored way above everybody else. Now, this doesn't, it doesn't make much sense, first of all, because it doesn't make much sense that Shanghai scored that high uh, a big, uh, on average. Uh, because, I mean, Taiwan scores very high. And I keep telling everybody that fundamentally, people from Shanghai or people from Taiwan. I mean, that's where they, all the people from Taiwan, all the Chinese from Taiwan came from Shanghai and some of these other provinces near Taiwan. So it doesn't make sense. But uh, PISA did give the test uh, in a lot of places in China. They just didn't publish the results. <laughs> they only published this one place. <laughs> so um, it's just ridiculous that they're even allowing people to run around and use these data for anything. But the fact is that China does score very high. India scores w much worse than Brazil from the two states that took to PISA, the sort of middle-income states. Uh, the only country that scored worse than India was uh, Kazakhstan of the, all the countries that took to PISA. So India has this very elite small group at the top, but they're going to have a hard time expanding quality engineering education. If you can't get people in, you know, deep down. So many of the institutions that are now accepting Indian students into engineering are accepting below par kids in terms of math preparation. So the outcome, they're not great institutions to start with, so the outcome is dismal. And in fact, employers complain that we can't, you know, that most of these graduates can't do anything. So they end up working in call centers. So when you call United Airlines, you're probably getting an uh, engineering graduate who's talking to you from India, uh, from, uh, from um, either Bangalore or Mumbai uh, with these calls. So, uh, so we end up in our study saying, <clears throat> look, like people coming out of these elite institutions in these countries, uh, probably half of them are competitive with the top half of American institutions. So yeah, there are more of them uh, coming out of these countries, but the numbers are not hugely more, you know. Uh, and so, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not the apocalypse quite yet. Uh, uh, depends how much they can improve uh, how they're doing. The Chinese seem the best positioned to do well simply because they produce such good math results uh, compared to these other countries at the secondary level. And so they're really drawing on a population. Their, uni their, their universities may not be so great, but the kids coming into them are very smart compared with, let's say, India, which is in serious, can't do very much. Uh, there are other issues in India. They produce hardly any PhDs in engineering, hardly any, 1,400 a year right now. Can't staff anything with that. So, uh, so we, we have a whole chapter on quality, and we end up pretty much saying Brazil is somewhere in the middle. Uh, Brazil has a problem with the numbers, the student quality of students coming in, but their universities are not bad. The elite universities are pretty good, and so they're producing. They don't produce many engineers, as you can see. It is increasing, uh, but uh, in terms of Brazilian needs. Uh, they could do better, but they're not doing as badly like India. And Russia is actually in good shape. Their only problem is their um, government, uh, which uh, uh, every time Russians 
leave Russia and go somewhere else, like to Silicon Valley or Israel, uh, they end up with, in, once they're allowed into that kind of system, end up producing an incredible number of innovations. Uh, uh, Israel is now the largest, uh, outside the U.S., the largest exporter of original software, like for your phones and stuff, all these apps. A lot of these apps are coming out of Israel. And it's Israeli entrepreneurs with Russian engineers, basically. Uh, but Russia has tons of them. They're very well trained. The trouble is the system is completely uninnovative. By the way, they are starting uh, a sort of Silicon Valley outside Moscow. Uh, and MIT has signed on to run their university, elite research uh, high-tech university for them. Tired out? All right, good. We're right on time. Look for the book.